The Wayfarer Redemption by Sarah Douglas. So first of all, before I even get into the review, uh, a little bit of an apology. You might be able to hear this in my voice already. Uh, I, the, the throat's a little bit scratchy. I, I'm a little bit sick, bit of a sore throat, a cough. It's not ideal situation to be filming a review in, but uh, you'll excuse me, I'm, I'm going to power through this anyways, or going to try to, because I, I have time tonight. The, the baby went to sleep early tonight. I've got a free half hour uh, before bed, and I don't know when else I'm going to have time. Uh, you, you know, I'm at that point in my life where I just have to grab time when I have it. So, uh, you know, I, I'll probably be drinking this water from time to time. Just bear with me. But yeah, uh, that being said, on with the review. So you can tell by the cover, I'm sure, that this is a uh, pulp fantasy book. Uh, I do not read as much fantasy as I would like to. Uh, largely because I don't read as much of anything as I would like to. I, uh, like a lot of people on BookTube, I have ambitions to read a lot, but I don't find, find it hard finding the time and concentration to actually get through a lot. Um, but every now and again, I, I get tempted to just dip my toes into the water and, and try something out. The other complicating factor, if you've been watching this channel, I'm living in Vietnam. Uh, have excuse me, have been living in Asia for a long time now, and so um, it's difficult to get a hold of a whole series and read the series through. Quite often in a used bookstore, uh, I'll find one book in a series. Uh, but then I, I, I can't follow the whole series through, and so that's a frustration. But every now and again, I, uh, I get the urge to just try out one book, even if I know I won't be able to finish the series. Uh, and th that was the case with this one. I found this uh, in a used bookstore in Saigon. Uh, in Book Street, uh, if, if anyone is familiar with Saigon, where, where they have a lot of, uh, where they have a few used bookstore stalls there, excuse me. Uh, and I, I don't know, it looked a little bit interesting. You, you can see the, the, the pages here of uh, brown, uh, brown colorings on it, which I, I think might just be from the humidity here in the tropics. Uh, it, it, it looked like something that was a bit trashy, uh, but kind of in a fun way. And I picked it up on a whim. I, you know, I picked it up, I put it back, and I thought, no, I, I don't want to waste my time with, on this. And then I walked a few steps away, and then I picked it up again. And I thought, well, it, it might be fun just to see what this is all about. Dip my toes in the water. Uh, even... Though I, I, you, you can tell immediately that this is part of a longer series. And uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to track down the rest of the series, but I decided to check out the first book. So uh, I've tried to do a little bit of research on this uh, on Wikipedia uh, and Goodreads and stuff like that. Um, this book was first published in 1995 excuse me, in Australia. The author is Sarah Douglas. Now, this, this is a little bit unclear whether it was published simultaneously in Australia and in the U.S., um, but I got, I got the impression that this book was already a success in Australia before it got its international publication. So, I yeah, I guess maybe uh, it, it had... It had some time to grow in popularity in Australia first. Um, yeah, I mean, the in Wikipedia, it has 1995 as a publication date. My copy here says the first U.S. edition is 2001. Um, Wikipedia doesn't indicate there was a delay in the U.S. edition, but I, I don't know. Um, 
But there, there were different titles. So in Australia, this was uh, called Battle Axe, which was first book one of the Axis trilogy. Uh, in the U.S., it was named The Wayfair Redemption. Now, in, there are six books in total. Apparently, in Australia, they're published as a, a trilogy, so the Axis trilogy. And then there's a second trilogy, which is called The Wayfair Redemption Trilogy. The Wayfair Redemption Trilogy is also the name, sorry, The Wayfair Redemption is also the name of the this book as it's published in the U.S., so that's a little bit confusing. Um, and I think the whole series is known as the Wayfair Redemption series in the U.S. or Australia. I don't remember. It's, it's all on Wikipedia. Um, but anyways, uh, book one of uh, a six-book series which in Australia is divided into two trilogies and in the U.S. was just released as six books, according to my internet research. Um, yeah, so uh, it's... Sorry, I'm just trying to think where to start with this. You can obviously tell from the cover uh, it's a, a fantasy paperback. Um, but I, I was thinking there there's probably a, a few different types of fantasy. There's stuff like Tolkien and C.S. Lewis where they're relying on uh, established folkloric characters like dwarves, elves, goblins, dragons. Um, but then there are some fantasy writers that just completely make up their own world. Uh, and this is one of the latter. So uh, it's, it's recognizably fantasy uh, in the sense that it's medieval. So, you know, there's castles, there's kings, there's dukes, there's swords uh, and shields and bows and arrows. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess you have to at least have that much to be considered fantasy. Um, it's also recognizably fantasy in the sense that it follows a lot of the established tropes and cliches of fantasy. The prophecy, the chosen one, uh, the, the, the forces of evil versus the forces of good, uh, etc. We'll, we'll get more into that later. Um, but it's, it's not Tolkien-esque in, in the sense that there are no dragons or elves or anything. The, 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 this is all creatures that she's invented for this. So you have uh, creatures like the Ikari, which are a type of birdmen who live beyond the forest, and the Avar, which are uh, horned people who live in the forest. And you have a, re a religion of uh, Artar, which is the god of the plow, um, etc. Et you, you get the idea. So it's uh, it's it's a lot a lot of world building out out of whole cloth. Um, which I don't know I I call me a little bit conservative in my taste maybe I I tend to prefer fantasy that that goes with the mythic creatures I'm already familiar with. Uh, it's a little bit I don't know more familiar and less strange. I, 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 I know, I, I should be more open-minded. Um, but I actually enjoyed this book quite quite a bit. Uh, in spite of its flaws, and I will get to its flaws, uh, Sarah Douglas just writes very well. So everything is very clear. Everything is explained in the text. There are lots of... There are lots of new things, but it, you know, it, it was never a problem kind of understanding it. I, I, I thought... The, the, the elements of the fantasy world were introduced uh, at, a, at a pace that was not overwhelming. Uh, it, it, it was well done in that respect. Now, the, the beginning of the book uh, starts out uh, after, after kind of a couple prologues. Um, the scene is there's a, a kingdom and the kingdom uh, has a, uh, up at the north, there's a northern frontier 
where everything is cold and snowy and icy. And there is an ancient evil which is awakening in that uh, northern frontier and is beginning to uh, to cause trouble there to the, to the extent that the wild men who live up in the snowy lands are beginning to flee southward for their lives uh, and causing problems with that northern frontier, uh, as well as reports of this, this big evil awakening in, in, in the north and, and the idea that a, 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 a new ice age is coming is, is the, somewhat hinted as well, an, an, um, a new snowy season. So, uh, of course, uh, you're thinking, ah, Game of Thrones, right? Uh, and then, if that wasn't enough, uh, on page 30, uh, we get uh, one of the characters saying to another character that the king really doesn't have a very clear heir, uh, and that when he dies, it looks like there's going to be civil war. Um, even though it would be, would be da disastrous for the kingdom. Uh, so, quoting here from that page. Uh, but that would mean civil war. Are you suggesting that our fathers would be so disloyal? Faraday valued loyalty almost above, sorry, valued loyalty above most other virtues. Well, the prize would be worth it, wouldn't it? Um, Devera snapped the wine she had drunk, making her tongue dangerously loose. So now we're really talking Game of Thrones, right? A civil war going on in the south. Well, this uh, looming ancient evil is coming down from the Icelands. Um, now, uh, this book was published in 1995, so there's no way that it could be ripping off the Game of Thrones TV show. Although I checked Wikipedia, and the first book in the Game of Thrones series was published in 1991, so I don't know if there's any cross pollination there or not. I don't know. Um, at, at any rate, uh, in this book, the, the Civil War never comes. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hinted at, but it never comes. I'm, I'm not sure if that's going to come in, in in later books. But, uh, but yeah, there, there's um, some Game of Thrones type vibes in here. But, but there, there's a lot of things that are reminiscent of other things in this book. Um, <clears throat> the other franchise that, that I uh, had strong um, reminiscences of, strong associations with, uh, was Avatar. Um, not, not The Last Airbender, but the, the James Cameron 2009 movie Avatar. Um, so, as in the Avatar movie, we start off with these main characters uh, believing that the other races out in the wilderness are the savages, and, and they are the forces of civilization. Oh, but, uh, by the way, spoilers. We're getting into spoilers here. But a as uh, the plot progresses... They eventually become aware that their whole worldview is wrong. Everything that they've been taught by their civilization is wrong. And their civilization is actually the aggressors. Uh, and it's these other cre uh, creatures who live out in the wilderness, the, the winged uh, people and the horned people, uh, who are actually uh, the, the good guys. Um, and then there's the there's a out in the wilderness there's this like tree of life that's really sacred uh and uh there's a scene where the the winged creatures and the horned creatures are having a ceremony in front of the tree of life and then they they get attacked and all of a sudden the tree of life is in danger and uh, of course i thought ah oh, this is just like that movie Avatar, where where their their tree of life gets attacked. Um, now the the outcome is different. Uh, that spoilers again. They in this book they end up saving the tree of life, but that that scene just kind of crystallized it uh, for me that this was very reminiscent of Avatar. 
But again, Avatar came out in 2009. This book came out in 2000, sorry, 1995. So there's, there's no way that this could be ripping off Avatar. Um, except that Avatar, as everybody pointed out when it, when it came out, uh, Avatar was itself just recycling uh, themes from a whole bunch of other older movies. Uh, Pocahontas, Dances with Wolves, uh, Fern Gully. Um, apparently, uh, even before the the 90s, that, that this was a common theme in Jimmy Stewart movies or uh, something like that. So, uh, yeah. Um, quite possibly that the author here is uh, just drawing on those tropes. Um Something I, I read, I, after I finished this book, in, in the course of doing a little bit of research on it, I did read a few other reviews of it. Um, reviews that I found doing a Google search and Amazon reviews and Goodreads reviews. Lots of other people um, have picked up on the fact that this author is using a lot of fantasy cliches and fantasy tropes. Uh, so there's the ancient prophecy. There's the chosen one. There's, you know, the two brothers who have to fight each other, one good brother and one bad brother. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's uh, the long-lost father. There's, the, yeah, there's just uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff um, that the author, uh, it, it seems to be borrowing or, or drawing from. But, I, I mean, again, look at this. Uh, this, this is a this is a mass market bar, mass market paper book genre fiction. So uh, can you really complain that this follows the tropes of its genre? I mean, my understanding is you almost have to to get published, right? The the, the publishing industry or the market expects certain tropes. Um, If you can hear that, that sounds like the baby crying. Uh, I'm, I may have to take a break during this review. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Uh, we got the baby sleeping again. So, um, where was I? Talking about the, the various tropes and cliches in this book. Uh, the, the chosen one cliche uh, is, is the big one. So, uh, I mean, the whole book is, the main plot is how the character Axis is realizing he's the chosen one in the prophecy. But then there's another character, his love interest, Lady Faraday, who halfway through the book realizes that she's the chosen one. She's Tree Friend, uh, who is an, another special person. And then there's another girl whose name is uh, Azur, who uh, is one of the side characters, but then she realizes that, that realizes that she's the chosen one kind of near the end of the book, and she, she's destined to become like the mother of nations or something like that. Um, so it, you know, it's not just one character is like the chosen one, but there's a whole bunch of people who are discovering that they're actually chosen to have special powers or special destinies. So, um, you know, that's a little bit cheesy, maybe. Although, again, to be perfectly fair, I my impression is that this backlash against the chosen one cliche in fantasy writing or, or fantasy movies it has kind of happened on the internet within the past, I don't know, five or seven years or something like that. Um, in, in 1995, I don't know if it was, I don't, I don't think there was that negative reaction to chosen one cliches, although I don't know. I, I was not heavily involved in the fantasy scene back then. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so so there, there are some cliches. Um, what makes this book good is, is the writing, like I said earlier. Um, and with apologies, I'm not going to spend a lot of time 
dissecting the pros and talking about why it's good. Mostly just because I, I don't have the literary chops to dissect pros like that. Um, but, you, you know, when something's readable, you know it. And this was very readable. Uh, and also, I, I, I mentioned I'd been reading some other reviews online. This is something that most other reviewers mentioned. Uh, even people who gave it negative reviews says it's, it's very readable. Some people, again, talking about the other reviews I've, I've been reading, some people complain that it was a little bit cheesy. And it can be a little bit cheesy. Uh, the, the main, my, I guess one of my main complaints is would be Axis, the main character, comes up a little bit too moody and brooding, uh, and some of the, some of the scenes surrounding him doing that come off as a little bit too, too much, um, but... I, I think I think as far as the the pros working it 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 works it's it's very readable. Um, and I think the plot beats hit hit where they need to hit. Um, again, I'm 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 influenced by the fact that I read a whole bunch of other reviews of this book before filming my own review. So you'll. You'll excuse me if I'm always kind of going back to what, what I've read online, but some people uh, com have complained uh, that th this book was too predictable. Uh, more than one person did. Uh, that, you know, saying kind of once you know the cliches of fantasy genre and you, you read this book, you can just guess what's going to happen. I, I didn't have that so much. I mean, in retrospect, you can look back and you say, well, of course. Uh, but, well, I, you know, I probably I don't read enough fantasy to just be thinking in those cliches yet. And maybe I turned my brain off when I read this. Or, or maybe I'm just not that smart. I don't know. But uh, the, 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 the various revelations and twists in the plot, when they happened, largely worked for me. Uh, they, they, I, I, I wasn't predicting them. I wasn't thinking ahead, and they, they had the the suitable impact on me. Pacing in this book uh, is also good. Uh, you, I, I think, I think the the beats happen when they need to happen. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's a longer book. Uh, well, I guess fantasy is a genre where things tend to be long, isn't it? Um, so 613 pages here, and, and then the rest here is like a glossary. Uh, you know, you know how fantasy books have glossaries of all the races and places. Um, although I will say, actually, sorry, qu quick digression while I talk about the glossary. Uh, I use this glossary a little bit in the opening chapters. But, uh, but you don't really need it. Uh, I don't know if the publishers made her put her, this in or what, but I, I, everything is explained in the narrative. So, you know, as you read, you pick up the information you need. You, you don't need the glossary. Um, so yeah, the, the, the pacing and the plot beats I thought were good. Um, what's, uh, What's not maybe so great uh, is some of the flat character arcs. So uh, we start off with uh, some characters who are disagreeable. Um, if you're familiar with this book, I'm thinking of characters like uh, Bornheld uh, and Gilbert, who who are uh, have uh, antagonist mystic relationship to uh, the other characters uh, and who uh, are portrayed as being very rough and abrasive. Um, and I was kind of thinking that as the book went on, they would learn some lessons and they would grow and they would become more sympathetic and, you know, they would have a character arc. I, I was briefly thinking that at the very beginning. 
but it, it became very clear fairly early on that that was not where this was book this book was going uh, at all. Um, there's there's a lot of foreshadowing in this book. Uh, I mean, this is one of those books which is relying on prophecy, so you're getting visions ahead, uh, and um, you you pretty much get explicitly told that these characters are not going to get redeemed that they they they're just going to be antagonistic and and abrasive and jerks the whole time and uh Gil Gilbert's character uh fades out near the middle but Bornheld's character goes on to become the the main antagonist for the the second part of the book um so yeah it i mean it's it's, it's in reality, as we all know, uh, human beings are infinitely complex. There, there's, there's no such thing as good people and bad people. There are uh, a range of, of uh, we, all, we all have the potential for good or bad actions. But uh, typically in fiction, of course, this uh, complexity is overlooked and you have the good guys and you have the bad guys. Um, now that's not superior fiction, of course, but uh, but it's it's a lot of fiction, and and this is one of those books. Um, th there there are some surprises. Uh, for example, Jamie, I think that how his name is supposed to be pronounced, who is kind of like the Pope in this book, the the equivalent to the the Pope. The, the, I mean, the, this is a fantasy world, but the, the head of the religion, religious organization in this book, uh, starts out the starts out the book, and you think he's he's going to be the main sympathetic character, um, but then by the end of the book, he's he's been turned into a, a villain. Um, but that's not because he has a character arc. That's just because it turns out that the things that you thought you knew about him. Were, were wrong so that there is there is that kind of thing going on but, the, but there's no real character growth um i i will briefly mention something else that has come up some of the reviews that i've read of this book uh have put it in the context of the larger series i'm not going to read the larger series because like i said i'm, I'm out here in vietnam and and I, I just stumbled upon this book in a used bookstore. But apparently in the larger series, some of the characters who are sympathetic now become more morally flawed as the series goes on. Uh, they, they make some selfish choices. So uh, that, that could be interesting. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to see that through, obviously, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, may, maybe in, in future books, Sarah Douglas does does more with the complexities of human nature. Um, but actually, while, while I'm mentioning it, I, I may as well say uh, another thing which has come up is most people don't seem to appreciate the later books. There's, there seems to be a consensus that the the story just goes a little bit off the rails as the books go on. Uh, and in fact, uh, somebody, as, I, as I've been doing the weekly reading vlogs ab about this book, um, Bethany Bruninga Sokola, apologies if I mispronounced that, I probably did, uh, left me a couple comments. Um, and if, if, if you're listening to this re review, thank you for those comments, uh, saying that uh, she she uh, enjoyed the first book, but then the rest of the series got a little bit too weird for her. So uh, I'll, I'll take that as um, meaning maybe it's just as well that I'm not going to be continuing on with this book. Uh, I, I thought this first book did all right, though. And, you, you know, even though I knew going into it that was part of a larger series, I still felt like I got a satisfactory ending here. Like, uh, obviously, the, the larger battle uh, between the forces of good and the forces of evil has not been resolved because we've got six more books to go. But the... the 
there was a suitable climax to this one volume, is what I want to say. So I, I, I left this feeling largely satisfied. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think really that's all I want to say about this book for now. Um, I don't know how many people like me are interested in, in reading just the first volume of, of a fantasy series and, and then leaving it. But uh, I'd give this, I don't know, maybe seven out of ten stars. It, it, was, it was definitely readable. Um, yeah, so, it, it, you know, let me know in the comments if you've read this book, if you've read the series. What, what did I miss? Uh, what did you think of it? Uh, Etc. And, and I'll finish up here.